Hello, 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 everybody. How are we this evening? I hope you're all well. Um, my name is Kieran. I'm, did I change my name? I did, well done me. Um, so I'm uh, an astronomer at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, and I'm so excited to be joined today by Professor Alistair Glass, who is also an astronomer here. And we are gonna just kind of, we're just gonna have a chat really. Um, and we're going to talk about lots and lots of different things, but the kind of theme of today is uh, we're going to be talking about kind of building up to the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a really exciting telescope that's going to be launching um, in October of this year, fingers crossed. Um, do you want to say hello, Alistair? I just want to make sure you're... Yes, hello, Alistair. Yeah. Well, hello, hello, Alistair. Um, so <laughs> I'm at, uh, as, as Kieran says, I work at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. But of course, like a, you know, most of us, I'm at, I'm at home. This is my son's back bedroom at the moment while he's away at university. Uh, so I, I, I'm uh, one of the instrument scientists working on the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'm in charge of uh, commissioning our camera that we built in Europe um, due for launch in October. So I'm busy with the rest of the team at the moment trying to practice and train to run the spacecraft um, during the first six months of operations, so it's um, yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of exciting, verging on on nerve wracking and quite stressful. I've got to say, uh, I think all the best things are a little bit of both, right? Yeah, yes, indeed. It's the sort of thing where you, where you kind of think this is going to be really great when it's done, when it's finished. Yes. You know, it'll be really a re really good thing to look back on. But um, yeah, I mean, let's hope it. You know, it's in space, right? So it's a space observatory. So the biggest risk really for us still is the launch. Um, and um, yeah, so I think once we get through the launch, then after that, hopefully the stress will drop quickly. Yeah. Before we get started on this, I actually need to talk about some really boring things. Well, mm -hmm. boring, for, boring for, for people who know, but important for people who don't. So first of all, um, a lot of you have noticed have found the chat. So if you, if you have like comments you want to say, or like if we ask you questions and you want to chat with us, uh, put things in the chat, we will be able to read them. Your other uh, attendees won't. So there's no cross chat between attendees, but if you want to chat to us, um, you can do so with the button at the bottom. There's also another button titled Q&A. So if you have any specific questions you want to ask about what we're chatting about, you can put them in there and we'll try and have some time at the end to uh, talk about those. Uh, other things, there will be a recording of this, which will go up on our website, which I'll link to at the very end. Um, if you only get little bits of it, if you're eating dinner or whatever. Um, and also uh, there is a transcript or a subtitles button at the bottom as well. Um, so if you're struggling to understand us, if we're mumbling or whatever, um, hit the subtitle button. They're also generated. So I apologize if they don't understand us either, but they're, they're all right. Um, yeah, so they're worth using too. So let's get started. And I kind of want to ask, uh, I want to ask this to you, Alistair, but I also want to ask this to people in the chat, which is like, what do you like about stargazing? What do you like about kind of astronomy and space and things like that? Yeah. Um, stargazing isn't really <laughs> right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that heavily into stargazing. I must admit my best kind of, uh, you know, the, one of the best evenings I've had star, stargazing was with a group of brownies up here in Scotland, uh, where we were looking at movements of the, of the moons of Jupiter. And that was pretty good fun um, on a, you know, on a good summer night. But uh, I, yeah, last couple of weeks I've been concentrating on staying indoors and staying warm, to be honest. Yeah, I, f I actually find that in Britain as well, that in theory, I really like stargazing, but the best time to do it is February. <laughs> it's... When the nights are short. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. So is that, is that the, uh, the, that's the sky right now, yeah, with Orion rising? Yeah, so this is the sky right now. So this is kind of when is the best time for stargazing, A, because the nights are long, and B, because you've got some really, really good constellations in the sky. So yeah, this is, there's Orion there. Um, so if you were going to do some stargazing with some brownies right now, what kind of things would you tell them to look out for? Uh, well, I mean, right. So my, my interest is exoplanets. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, the, uh, 
the, the kind of the, the interesting area of the sky, if you're, if you're interested in kind of the, the, it's like the juxtaposition of the history of exoplanets and, uh, and, and, and the current field is, is the square of Pegasus, which is up right now, uh, but is setting. So it's over in the, over in the West, I think. Yes, I think for JV2, let's see if I've done this right. I mean, there's, you know, yeah, yeah. we can talk about Orion. Shall we, is this the right one? Have I gone? Their binoculars, Orion's pretty. Oh, I think it's further around, but. Um... Yeah, it's, I think I've hit the right button. Okay. No, I haven't, sorry. If you search for the star, can you search for Alpha Peg? Would that, that should, that should take you there. Because it's easy to find anyway. So in Pegasus, it's kind of. So yeah. this, I'll zoom out a little bit actually so we can that's, see. Yeah, that's so this is the constellation Pegasus. So yeah, if you went outside right now, you would just catch it before it's setting. It's kind of on its way out. Yeah, it's reasonably bright um, as you can see. But in fact, just where you're zooming in there, all right, there, there are two stars there. I mean, the first one of interest, which is. Um, it's that one and that one. Well, there's, there's 50, oh, you've. You know what I'm going to say? I'm psychic. I know a lot about these stars. But go on. <laughs> well, well, marker two. I don't know what marker marker two. I'm guessing is 51 Peg, which is the that's the uh, the first star or the first exoplanet that was discovered. The first real exoplanet, like the first proper, you know, planet orbiting another star, and that was discovered by um, by uh, uh, Didier Kales back in 1995. Um, and so that was a uh, that was kind of pivotal in my you know, my career, right? I've been working in astronomy for what, 35, 40, 40, God, 40 years, 40 years, <laughs> horrifying. And most of my career, yeah, up until 1995, there were ideas about, you know, about how frequent stars might have planets, uh, you know, their own, their own planetary systems, uh, what, how those planetary systems might form. But I mean, I, when I was a kid back in, back in the, you know, early 70s or whenever, I remember reading sort of popular astronomy books there and theories about how planetary systems were formed. Some of them were acquiring that you had two stars pass close to each other and one would kind of drag this sort of blob of material out from another star which would condense. And all of that kind of changed in 95 because no one up until then, no one had actually made a direct observation, you know. You know, science, is, it's, it's not belief, it's about measurement and what you actually have evidence for and have, have seen. And that was this first discovery of this exoplanet. And it's, uh, and it was around, it's around this star. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a uh, Jupiter mass planet. So it's, if, you're, if you're familiar with Jupiter, big gas giant, bright, bright planet in the sky. Um, I don't think it's, it's up at the moment, but uh, you know, it's not up at this time of night. But anyway, biggest planet gas giant in, in, in our solar system. But uh, 51 Peg has a planet comparable to Jupiter, but very much closer to the star. And so, so it's let's, been... take, let's take a step back a second, actually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you explain to me what is an exoplanet? Because I've heard of them, but they're not something I'm an expert in. Well, so okay, so an exoplanet is really just a planet that is orbiting a star that is not our own sun. So we've got right. our, uh, our, you know, nine or 10, eight, nine or 10 planets in our solar system that we're all familiar, familiar with. But all of the other stars are so far away that up until recently, it's been impossible to discriminate between the bright light of a star and anything that might be really close into it, like, a, like it, its own family of planets, yeah? Um, and so, there, and, and again, in my early, you know, when I was, my early career back in the 80s, I guess, there were, it was, um, it was always regarded, you know, obviously people have thought, yeah, it would be great if we could look for planets orbiting other stars. But the bias, the thought that people always had was that they would be looking for planets like our own planets in the solar system. Okay, So the Earth is tiny compared to Jupiter. Yeah. And so when we imagined well, looking, looking out into space and trying to see a planet like the Earth orbiting another star, if you do the numbers, you kind of think, no, that's, that, that's never going to work, okay? Especially not using the sort of telescopes that we had back in the 80s. The trick was not looking for a direct image of a planet, but looking for the wobble that, that, a, that a big, hefty, hefty, massive planet makes in, uh, in the position, in, in, it, in the parent star, yeah. 
So it's like, um, you know, it's, it's a parent star is attached to the planet by gravity. And so as the planet orbits it, orbits it, it makes the, the star wobble around in the opposite direction slightly. So how big are these wobbles? Would I be able to, if I watch the star, would it move like sort of this far? Would it be, yeah, well, how big would it be? Um, it would, it would, okay, they do, the, 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 the star do move in the plane of the sky, yeah? So if you, if you can measure really exactly where the star is, you will see it wobble side to side. But it, 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 the, the size of that wobble is, is um, of the order of a million miles or so. Okay? So in the case of the sun, it's a distance that's less than or comparable to the diameter of the star itself. And detecting a motion that's that small in stars that are so far away has again been beyond our technological capability. Until, until recently, right? There's a spacecraft called Gaia that can actually do that or has been able to do that recently, which is kind of, yeah, I'd say that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. However, the, the other trick to detect the wobble is, it, is, is not to look for the wobble on the sky side to side, but to detect the wobble, you know, forwards and backwards, yeah? So you imagine that if a planet is orbiting a star, can you see, you can see my hand, my hand is the star. <laughs> Going around this, sorry, <laughs> we only use the highest highest tech demonstrations here at the ROE. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you know, the, the, okay, the planet's going around, so it's, it's making the star wobble side to side a bit. But as the star is going, as the planet is going, you know, forward the way and back the way, so it's making the uh, the star move in and out of the plane of the sky. Yeah, it's getting slightly further away and slightly closer by a million miles or so. You can detect that because it, you can detect the velocity of the star. You can measure the velocity of the, st the star towards us and away from us using the Doppler shift. Okay, you know the thing that makes you know trains go by and the, with a whistle going and it's you know as the light as the as the frequency of sound changes as something comes towards you or goes away, you get the same effect with the light from the from a st from these stars, and so if you can detect a narrow spectral line, a very specific color that the, the star is shining in brightly, then if you have a good enough instrument, you can detect that very, very slight shift in frequency. And that's how the how Kalos and Mayov discovered that's that. So that's incredible that these, uh, these stars are actually moving all the time because of their tiny, well, much smaller planets that are pulling on them. Yeah, well, everything's moving all the time. I mean, the sun, our, our sun, it's not, you know, it's not fixed there. It is also wobbling in this kind of really complicated pattern uh, because it's always being tugged on by Jupiter, Earth, you know, well, it's Jupiter first because that's the most massive planet. Oh, wow, of course. So if you have multiple planets, you know, it's being pulled every which way. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, our sun is, is orbiting around the center of the galaxy, but it's doing it like a, you know, like a drunk going down the pavement, right? It's also <laughs> wobbly, wobbly side to side, yeah. Um, yeah. Wonderful. All, all, but as I say, it's wobbling by, you know, I, 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 I don't know what the, the amplitude of the wobble is for the Earth, but um, the, in terms of the Doppler shift, yeah, of, of how much the Earth makes the sun move in kind of in velocity, yeah, uh, how, uh, that, that's uh, down at the level of um, 10 centimeters per second. So it's like a walking pace. Right? Oh, that's incredible to think of this absolutely giant astronomical body kind yeah. of just wobbling at walking pace. And we can measure that. That's incredible. Well, we can just, yeah, yeah. So one of, I mean, I'm, I'm, okay, so my job, I work on this, this James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the James Webb, we don't have a spectrometer on James Webb that can make these really, really fine measurements of frequency. But in Europe, we're building um, the large telescope in Chile. And so I'm the, uh, the COI, co-investigator for one of the instruments on there. And it has a spectrometer which is capable of making these measurements. But we are, when we're building, uh, we're building the spectrometer here in, uh, in Edinburgh, but with a consortium of European partners. Um, you know, the That's incredible. So if you want to find if you want egg, and if you want to see it wobble around, or maybe not because it's so small. Um, so the easiest way I found to find it was if you start looking south at Orion, 
and then you have say Taurus. So basically, what you want to do is you want to face Orion, and then you want to follow his bow sort of ninety degrees. So you if you're facing south, you want to turn ninety degrees to the right, and you'll end up facing west, and you'll see this kind of square of stars. So the um, the kind of legs are a little bit hard to see, but the square is pretty easy. And so on this bottom right side here, they're both about halfway down. Um, so this one's 51 peg, and this one is HR 88799, which I think we'll come back to later on, because um, that's a, a special one, but it's very similar to, but we'll come back to that later. So that's, if you want to find some exoplanets for yourself, that's something you can do. Um, Orion's pretty easy to find, and then you should be able to find this square about 90 degrees away. So the other thing I wanted to chat about that's going on today specifically and is visible in the sky is what's going on over here. So this is the moon. And just above the moon, you should be able to see this kind of red dot here, which is Mars. So I'll just zoom back out again to show everybody again. So this is kind of in between our Orion and our Pegasus. Um, you'll be able to see the moon. I think it's like a, a little crescent at the moment. And yeah, just above it is the planet Mars. And there's lots going on at Mars at the moment. Um, do you want to talk about this, Alistair, or should I? Um, I was trying to answer a question then. Sorry, I was distracted. Oh, no, you're good. Talking about the Mars landing, yeah? Yeah, we can, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, no, you, you, you start and I'll butt in. I can start. Okay, so this month, there has been three different visitors to Mars. So there's been an orbiter from the UAE called Hope, um, there's been a Tianwen-1 from China, so that's an orbiter that also has a little lander on. And then there's the kind of big daddy from NASA, which is um, Perseverance. So this is the latest in a series of rovers from NASA, which has all sorts of exciting bells and whistles on. Um, it's about the size of a car, and when it lands, it's brought down on this kind of spaceship type thing that's got like a crane on. And so it'll land and then the crane will fly off. It's really, really exciting. And that is landing today. Um, so if you want to go see it straight after this talk, there will be uh, the live streams of it landing on NASA TV. And I think there's a couple of others we have links to, which should be going in the chat at some point soon. So yeah, if, you want to, if you're not done with space stuff after this, I highly recommend going to see, um, going to see it land because I think it will be really, really exciting. Uh, Alistair, why are they landing? Why bother with Mars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. All right, why bother? Well, I mean, this, this, the, the, the right. It's a, it's all about the search for life. Okay, uh, I mean, that's you know, why is there a philosophical? In, why are we interested in 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 studying Mars? Uh, it is because Mars is the closest analog, the most Earth-like planet uh, in the solar system or at least the one, the most Earth-like that we have some access to, that we can get to. Uh, Venus is pretty well uninhabitable. It's got a really super hot, corrosive ac um, atmosphere. So there's nothing going on there. But Mars, okay, I mean, it's, it's Earth-like in, in the sense that uh, there's strong evidence that it has, uh, it, it, it had uh, surface water in the past, historically. It has um, um, uh, carbon dioxide uh, frozen poles. Um, and so, um, and, it, and it's not that much further away from the sun than the earth is. And so it gets, you know, it gets, a re it's not, it, it, yeah, it's, it's not exactly as warm as a Scottish winter, but it's, uh, but it's, you could imagine, you know, that it's, um, it's warm enough that there could be liquid water in places that could allow some kind of microbial life to survive even now, okay? Although these missions are more about looking for historical signs of life and looking at the, you know, in other words, um, um, fossils, I guess, you know, or some kind of fossil record of life, uh, but also in looking for uh, um, to see whether Mars had had it had had a history uh, of, uh, of of more activity. In other words, you know, surface water, and that's why I think the, the target location for this this uh, the, the the spacecraft's landing on in a couple of hours. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like um, an ancient river, river delta, or it looks like that at least. Yeah. So it's where, um, uh, it's, a, it's a crater, but where there's a, a, one of the walls of the crater has, has got this um, flood water that 
millions of years ago, looks like it burst through the side of the crater wall and left a kind of um, a, like a delta. You know, if, if you know of river deltas, there's a sort of delta pattern. Um, and so the idea is to land there and, um, well, uh, collect samples. I was, I was saying, I, 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 did, I only realized a couple of days ago, I actually know the, the um, it's a guy called Mike Thielen, who, who was, um, he, he designed the lander, um, or a, a large part of the lander. I mean, these things are all big team efforts. But this one is actually, uh, the, this lander, it differs from Curiosity, the previous rover, because I think it, I think it, um, it takes samples. It actually has a, a digger. The Curiosity landed in 2012, right? I think. Curiosity did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's a pretty similar lander, I think. Um, as you say, it's you know, it's like a, it's like the size of a small car, but without any uh, without a windscreen. Yeah. So what are they? So you, you get this lander there with all this amazing technology on. Mm. What specifically do you look for when you're looking for life? So what sam what samples do you take? Where do you go? Uh, well, you're looking for uh, you. Uh, well, if you're looking for active life, the key thing for that is, uh, is, is right, that, well, there are several things that you're looking for. One of them is, is, is the most basic, it's water activity, so-called. Um, so I've, I've actually got a PhD student just finished who designed a, a water activity center, sensor. So this is, it's like humidity. So if you, if you take a, a sample of, of the Martian atmosphere, should say the Martian atmosphere, it's extremely tenuous. It's less than 1% of the, of, the, of the air pressure that, that we have on the surface of the earth, right? So you, you or I could not survive there for very long without you know, oxygen to breathe. But maybe, but you know, this is life that can scavenge oxygen out of the air. Anyway, you need to have some form of water which you can use to, uh, to run chemical reactions. And so, uh, so the atmosphere needs to be humid. So you'll need a, you, I'm pretty sure they'll have a sensor on here, on, on um, what's it called again? Perseverance. Have a, I'm pretty sure, a, this isn't my, my expert field, I should say by a fair way, but, uh, but there's a sensor that which, which will detect, uh, taking an air sample, detect humidity. Then of course, you, you're, you're taking soil samples um, and, uh, and um, um, uh, putting reagent or, or getting them to react in other, you know, at, some, at some level, heating them up to see if you can stimulate a chemical activity. And then you're looking for the signs of life, okay? Which could be, um, um, in, in the most general terms, what you're looking for is, is something called non-equilibrium chemistry, okay? Because we're not exactly sure, but you know, this is alien life you're talking about. So it's not going to work by exactly the same rules as Earth life. You don't know that it's going to work like a carrot or a, a person, right? You know, or, or, or a squid. Yeah, <laughs> it'll have its own chemistry. So what, what, what you try and do is take some soil, as I say, check that it's moist at least, heat it up, and then see what gases come out of it in a closed environment. And if those aren't the sort of gases that you'd get if you just took some uh, completely um, dead you know, uh, soil and react and, and, he and heated it up, uh, then, okay, then you have to start doing some thinking and some explaining as to what might, ex what might be the reason for that non-equilibrium chemistry, where you know, at some level you kind of hope that the, the end result, you, well, you hope, okay, that's not very scientific, but one of the potential uh, reasons for that non-equilibrium chemistry is, is presumably is, is, is life. Okay. So uh, also, I'm guessing you could have all sorts of other processes that could produce this stuff. Exactly. Well, I mean, you'll, you'll be aware there was a recent, um, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere of Venus, there was a detection of a, uh, a, a, a sulfur chemical, which was believed to be, um, or, 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 you know, oh, well, a strong indicator of life. I mean, I think the way the way uh, the way the, the work has gone since then is that it's you know, there are clearly other ways of of, uh, of producing the same effect. So, the ideal, you know, what you really need to do, the bottom line for this is going to be getting a sample of soil back in the labs, back back on Earth, and being able to study the thing under the microscope. Okay, and I think that and that's why this is you know it's one of the interesting things about this mission. I think. Is that it does? Is it, it's going to take? It's got like little, you know, like drinks can-sized um, um, 
sample tubes that it will put soil into. And then in future, there's a future space mission plan, which in principle can, can go and collect these and bring them back to the Earth. That's incredible. So a, dr a drinks can's quite a lot. I always thought these sample containers were like, you know, like a teaspoon or something. That's a lot of soil. It's, I think they're quite big. As I say, I've seen pictures of them. They look big to me, unless I was looking at, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I just gave all wrong. <laughs> and they're not huge, but they're, they're, they're reasonably big. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, to get them, you know, there's all sorts of problems with getting them back to the Earth, right? You actually have to launch them on a rocket back into, from the surface of Mars. So it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's going to be interesting, but it, it's, it's, not, it's going to be another 10 years, 20 years. So some of the younger listeners on here might get involved with working, working on that sort of project, but uh, be beyond me. I always think that's a such exciting thing, though, that you lay the groundwork. Like, you, you think so far ahead in terms of these missions, and, like, you're planning for 20 years ahead where you might not even work on it. And I think that's so... It's quite a nice thing to do, really. Like, kind of... Well, it, it, it is. It is the thing that does truly get me. You know, that's that's what I do enjoy. Yes, it is. It is the idea of for me, astronomy has been a, con a kind of continuous process of learning and where and new generations come along, make their contribution. And then, you know, and then you get then you get old and your brain gets uh, gets stiff and you and you're shuffled off to the side, you know, and, <laughs> But it still feels good, you know. It still, I, I, yeah. As I say, I, 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 the best things for me. I, I love my students, you know, and uh, seeing them get into the field, really enjoy making a contribution. So as I say, this, um, it's she's uh, Pratana Desai is, is a PhD student, just finishing her PhD now, but she's designed a, a, a sensor, a, a little, a little experiment that can detect humidity of water. And already, they're, they're, NASA are interested in putting this on a spacecraft to go to Europa, which is one of the moons. That's incredible. Look for, yeah, it is. It is incredible. Yeah. To look yeah. for uh, this, this, uh, this signs of, uh, well, it's water vapor. Yeah. It's, uh, to measure water vapor. Wow. So if you're looking out for Mars, Mars is quite easy to find at the moment. So basically, if you just look for the moon and it's just above it, so it's just this guy here. Um, slightly harder to find that's nearby, and we're going to talk about this really quickly because we're kind of tight on time, is if you go, so if you imagine Mars being at the 12 o'clock position, and if you go to sort of the 4 o'clock position, there's another planet, and this one um, you need sort of binoculars or something like that for, but down here is Uranus. Yeah. So a little bit harder to find. If you look in binoculars, it'll be sort of bluey green color, um, so Uranus doesn't have any landers going to it. Um, very different world. How different is it, Alistair? Well, it's a, ga it's a gas giant, a smaller gas giant. It is one of the targets for, uh, for the James Webb Space Telescope uh, that's going to be launching at the end of this year. Uh, in fact, it's, it's super bright. That's one of its problems. It's almost too bright for us. It's kind of blindingly bright. Um, but yeah, so it's, as I say, it's a uh, it's, um, yeah, gas giant. I mean, that's, that's pretty well it. No, no, uh, no life on Jupiter on on uh, on, uh, on Uranus itself probably, but um, yeah. But this would be more like an exo or more like exoplanets we regularly find. Right. The one thing Colonel, I want to kind of try and convey is that exoplanets are like all any planet in our solar system. It has its exoplanet counterpart, but there are planets outside. You know, these exoplanets they're like anything you can imagine almost. So. You could take a you could take a, a a planet like Uranus, but you could find it much closer into its star, so it's being heated up. And Uranus is at like minus 150 degrees centigrade or something like that. Very very cold. It has um, 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 icy uh, clouds in its upper atmosphere. Bring that into to if that if, if you imagine another star where you have a planet like that, but much closer to its to its parent star, where it's being cooked in the same way that the Earth is, or or even a planet like Mercury is. Then it's super hot. It'll it'll be um, it, it'll it, again. It'll have different sorts of chemistry going on because it's so hot. Um, I mean, we're looking at uh, we're looking for for exoplanets that have uh, clouds, but they're clouds made of iron particles, clouds made of of uh, of uh, hot sand, that sort of thing, right? Really kind of bizarre worlds that are out there. And you know, that's always the great thing about science as well, right? Is it's all 
generally manages to go a bit further than your imagination. Yeah. So again, back when I was a kid and I'd read my astronomy books and it was all well, you know, it was all talking about our planetary system and how hard it would be to see our planetary system all, you know, it, around other stars. That's not what we're looking for now. We're looking for all sorts of weird exoplanets. I mean, there are the, the, um, the uh, super Earths, okay, are another target for us um, in the next few years. So um, a super Earth is a... Super bigger than the Earth. So a, a planet that has ma a mass, which is it's double the size of the Earth, could be rocky. Uh, some of them, there's, you know, there, there are, uh, as they get bigger, there are planets that have the mass of a planet like Neptune, but are ocean worlds. So they have thick, okay. you know, water oceans covering them to a depth of, of maybe, you know, a kilometre or kilometres, or many kilometres. So kind of like, I guess, the Earth, but with no land mass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Well, indeed, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they, as I say, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, this, this field has, ex, has, has exploded, really, over the last sort of 20 years, and it's really because there are so many possibilities coming up, and because the, the equipment that we've been building over the past 20, 30 years has really allowed us to start making measurements where we can, you know, we can actually, I mean, there, there are now several thousand planets being, being discovered. It must be over 4,000 now by recent missions. Discovered, but not, you know, we haven't got good sharp pictures of them yet, right? But I mean, I've got colleagues in, in space agencies now, and I'm involved in one of the, pro well, I'll, I'll hand it on to someone else, but there's a, a project planned called, um, uh, well, it, Darwin, uh, is, its, is its name, but the aim of Darwin is to be able to image an exo-Earth, and not just image it, but to measure its, its colours, its spectrum, to see in the infrared, because in the infrared, the planet Earth glows most brightly, the brightest colour that the Earth has um, is, is actually in the infrared, and it's the colour that is associated with ozone. You know, it's a colour that hasn't got a name, right? It's it's a it's a wavelength, it's light at a wavelength of nine point five microns, but it's it's light that is is. It's just light that our eyes aren't sensitive to, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Twenty times longer than the the wavelengths of light our, our eyes are sensitive to, but it's it's due to ozone. And so if 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 Darwin looks out into space, it can see a little dot, which is an Earth-like planet. It'll take its its light, split it into its colours, and if it's super bright in ozone, then that means that that planet's atmosphere has, uh, has lots of oxygen in it because ozone tends to go along with oxygen. And we certainly know that, at least on Earth, ozone is really important for life. Exactly. And where does, where does the oxygen in our atmosphere come from? Yeah. It's from trees, yeah? Trees and grass and whatever. It's from our biosphere. So that's how, in, in, uh, again, in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time, we'll be able to, uh, um, well... If, if we build these, these experiments, if we keep going, then we'll, uh, we'll be able to detect an exo-Earth. Oh, that's so exciting. And, 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 know, and know that when we look out there, that it's a, a planet that is green and covered in life of some form, which is, yeah, it's great. It's, great. it's a great time to be involved in, 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 in science now, I think. I absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. So I thought we'd move on. So the, the, the last thing we want to do is going to take a little bit of building to. So I thought the first thing we would talk about <laughs> is a special set of constellations which we're going to use to orient ourselves in the sky. So people in the chat, maybe, let's see if you can recognize what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to start off just showing them. Um, so I'm going to turn the ground off so we can see everything. So I'm going to, I'm going to zoom around them first. And then I'll, I'll tell you their names after we've gone around once. So ignore the green dot. Does anyone know which constellations these are? Let's see if we get anyone in the chat. Don't ask me. <laughs> I'm terrible at constellations. I've, not, I've never, you know. It's really embarrassing that like most astronomers are really bad at constellations. I've only got good at them after I stopped doing sort of professional astronomy, I guess. Yeah. So we've got one answer, somebody knows. I'll put the names on and let's see if anybody knows now. Maybe you're specifically drawn to one of these for some reason. You're not talking to me, are you? 
I, oh, I'm talking to chat and you. Maybe. I was going to say, oh, I'm a Virgo. I was born in September, you know. <laughs> oh, here's a big clue. So I, I'm particularly drawn to cancer. I was born in midsummer. Yeah, so what, people are getting it now. So these are the constellations of the zodiac, which aren't usually associated with astronomy. They're usually associated with astrology, which is uh, to do with when you were born and the, the motions of the stars. And supposedly they tell you about your personality and things like that, but we don't think that's real. Um, so the, re the reason that these are the zodiac ones and not any others is they form this sort of line going around the sky. So it, it's a little bit hard to see because it's not in 3D, but they form like a, a big circle. And this is the circle along which all the planets and the sun and the moon move. So you'll notice the moon's there. There's Mars. Oh, can't. So there's Mars, sorry. Uh, and then like you've got the sun here and you've got various other planets and things here. So they all move along this line, which is called the ecliptic. And all that means is just that's how all the planets are arranged and they all seem to move along this line. So you said you were a Virgo. What does that mean? Does it mean anything? <laughs> I've, I've really not, not much of an idea. I think it means I'm obsessed with detail, so it's probably true. You know. <laughs> oh, that's blown my credibility. So there's really only one thing that this means, which is, so at the moment, um, the sun, you'll notice, is in the constellation Aquarius. And all it means is if you were born when the sun is in this constellation, that's your star sign. So I can move ourselves up and down by like a month or so. And you'll see the sun move. So we're going to say same day. So we're going to stay on the, what day is it? 18th. And we're going to stay at 6 p.m., but we're going to move to March. So the 18th of March, you'll notice that the sun, oh, it's got kind of bright. Let's turn the atmosphere off. There we go. Yeah. So you'll notice that it's moved up this way. So we're not in Aquarius anymore. We're kind of in Pisces. And then we'll go another month. And now we're at the kind of tail of Pisces, getting into Aries, oh, yeah. getting into Taurus and so on. And this is all it means. So if you were born on the, where, what's the date? If you were born on the 18th of May, well, the sun's in Taurus. And something I found that's really interesting is if you go look up those astrology charts, they're actually all wrong. Um, they're actually all off by a month. And the reason for that is because this process isn't the same every year. It very slowly moves around. So when they were set hundreds of years ago, all the, the sun was in a slightly different position on the same day of the year, which I think is pretty cool. So we're going to use these for a specific reason. What are we going to use these for, Alistair? To help, help us know where we are in the sky. Well, okay. I'll, I'll give it a go. Right. So, um, okay. So that line, it's, it's um, as I say, it's not the sun and the stars that are moving around there, of course. It's the, it's, it's the, because uh, the sun relative to our, you know, the sun is, it's wobbling, but only by a tiny bit, as we were discussing earlier. This is the earth moving around the sun every year. And so the sun appears to go around our sky, to move in our sky and go all the way around once a year. So the reason Kieran's showing this, uh, I hope, is <laughs> it's to do with the green blob there. The mysterious green blob, which I haven't talked about. green blob. And so that is, uh, that is, we put that into Stellarium, into the program, uh, to represent the position of the James Webb Space Telescope. So the thing about the James Webb Space Telescope is it, it, after it's launched and you want to know where it is, it's, it's opposite the sun from the earth. So if you look at the sun or look towards the sun. You should then, never look directly at the sun, I should stress. <laughs> it's okay at night, but then you're looking through the earth. But yeah, indeed. So yeah. If you, if yeah you, at the moment, the sun's slightly under the ground. So you look, look in the direction of the sun and then you turn through 180 degrees and you're looking out into deep space, right? Away from the earth. And that's where James Webb is gonna be. It's at a, it's a stable position called, called the second Lagrangian point, um, but about a million miles away from the Earth, but away from the sun. 
just briefly to understand what this, the, the Lagrangian point means, right? If you think of satellites going around the Earth, they go around the Earth once every hour and a half. I think that if, so if you've looked up and you've seen a satellite passing over at night, that's why they, or in the evening or the, uh, or the morning, you see a satellite going, it's kind of clips over pretty quickly. The further away you are from the Earth, the longer it takes to go around. So um, geostationary satellites that, that beam TV all over the world, they're, uh, they're about, I uh, um, can't remember, 40,000 miles away. Miles. Yeah, yeah, whatever, okay. But they go around once a day. The moon goes around the Earth once a month. If that, and the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away. If you go out to a million miles, then the time that it takes to orbit the Earth is a year. So the JWST goes once around the Earth at the same time that the Earth goes once around the sun. And if you can kind of, you know, get your head around it all, the end result is that the, uh, the, is that the JWST stays in the same position in the sky relative to the, the line of the Earth and the sun. It's always out there. So that's where we put our spacecraft. The reason we put it out there, can you zoom in on that, Kieran? To, yeah, yeah, we can. Um, if, if, the, if the image of the spacecraft works, which would be good. Should do. So. Can you click on it and just. Yeah, it's heading. Oh, sorry, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Our telescope just takes a little bit of time to. It's lovely, that. It really, it really is. <laughs> this is a joint effort. I did the green blob. Kieran did the spacecraft. But I think together, you know, it's uh, <laughs> pretty well perfect. OK, so, the, so this is showing the JWST as it will be in, in orbit. And the, the point we want to make, OK, it's good, it, this is the, mo it's good, the most powerful, most sensitive uh, um, observatory ever built right, in, in, in the infrared. And so, oh, sorry, I just, so how does it do that? Well, it, we, we, you, for, for, to, make, to make a super powerful observatory, you need to put it somewhere super dark, right? It has to be extremely dark. And so that's why it's away from the Earth. It's away from the moon, which are both bright. The sun is also, of course, very, very bright. But the sun is, uh, is, 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 is off to the bottom right in this diagram. And so the JWST has this silver thing, which is the sun shield, which is protecting it. It's like providing a shadow to protect it. The from sun's the rays will be kind of coming up here. Exactly, yeah. And they all get bounced off, right? They all get bounced off. And so the spacecraft itself, all it can see is deep, deep space. And so it's, if you've ever lie, you know, lain on a beach after the sun's gone down in the evening, you'll get really cold really fast because your body radiates heat away into the dark sky. JWST will do the same thing. It cools down to minus 230 degrees centigrade. It takes it about a month to do it, but it gets very, very cold. It's very, very dark. And that's why it's there. One of the problems that it gives us, though, as a, okay, you can see the telescope there. It's, you see how the telescope is kind of pointing off to, to you know, uh, pointing off to the side. Yeah, it's pointing off, off at right angles to the direction to the sun. Okay. And so that means that we can only observe in, in, uh, in, in a kind of a donut or a, yeah, in a strip of sky. Because we, if we point the spacecraft, point the telescope towards the sun, it'll heat up. It won't have the benefit of that sun shield anymore. In fact, it'll break it if we point it towards the sun accidentally. So that's something we have to be pretty careful about. Well, let's see if we can visualize this. If I, oh. See if I did this right. Moment of truth. <laughs> Oh, I think I pressed the wrong button. I think we're going back to 51 peg. Yep. Oh well. It's a lovely, it's a lovely, lovely star. Anyway, but yeah, well, well, we're, we're let's yeah, that doesn't matter. Okay, but I mean people can, you know. Sorry, I'm just pressing the wrong button. I'm all over the place. But yeah, as I say, so that's one of the key things about it is that is that we can only observe this kind of this this ring around. Um, around a line with, but from the sun to the earth out through JWST. And so what that means for us is that um, when we're commissioning the spacecraft next year, it's going to be early next year that we actually get it, switch everything on and we start trying to do some science measurements with it. The best parts of the sky for us to look at are at the, they're called the ecliptic poles, but they're the North Pole and the South Pole, where we're looking at right angles to the sun, but still out into deep space. And so it's, it's not, not, we'll get onto this in a minute, but, uh, and so one of the, the key targets for us, one of the first things we'll look at, it's, it's uh, 
well, there are two regions of the sky. One of them would be around, you know, near Polaris, the North Star, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. And we'll do some observations up there. But in the Southern Hemisphere, there are constellations that you can only see from Australia and, and, uh, and objects that you can only see in the Southern Hemisphere from Australia. And one, or from L2, the JW, JWST can look at. And so uh, one of those is the Large Magellanic Cloud. So it's like a, a sort of a, a mini galaxy that's um, 50,000 or so light years away from, uh, from our own Milky Way. But it's got thousands, well, millions of stars, including exotic uh, um, um, stars that have bright spectral lines, planetary nebulae that are going off, supernova remnants, all sorts of, as I say, it's like a mini galaxy. And we can point at it with the James Webb and use that to, as a kind of a, like a lab specimen, you know, like a test bed, so that we can make observations there. Okay, okay. sorry about that. I think we've got our visuals back. So all right. at yes. the moment, James Webb is in Leo, so over here. Well, it's... And the sun is in Aquarius. Okay. So basically what you were saying is the telescope can only observe in this kind of strip in the middle, right? Yeah, that's right. So basically, if we go kind of in the middle here, so we're going to be around kind of where Aries are. Actually, I think that's where Mars and the moon are at the moment. So if you go out and stand in the sky, and this is a little hard to visualize, I'm afraid, but you kind of have to, it's hard to fit everything in on a flat screen. Um, so if you stand looking south, and then if you look over towards the east, just under Leo's head, that's where James Webb will be. And if you also look out to the west, where the sun was, um, that's where the sun is. So in the middle, you've got Orion here, and you've got Taurus, and it's kind of the strip will run yeah. up and down where you're looking and kind of imagine it'll go over your head and all the way around and come back. And that's where the telescope can look. And then, and then as, as the year goes by, then that strip of visible of visibility that moves around as well. Yeah, if we go on, say, three months, one, two, three. You can always see anything, yeah? Because you can look all the way around the strip. So if you think about it, just wait six months and, and whatever you want to look at will come into view. Yeah, so say now we've gone on three months. So now the telescope is in Libra. The sun is over in Orion because... Orion's a winter constellation, so it's not one you can see in the summer. So, the, and that's because it's behind the sun, basically. And now what's in the middle is Leo, which is where the telescope used to be. So kind of what happens is through the months of the year, yeah, you step around this circle and you can only view things in this strip at very specific times, which is kind of annoying, but that's life. Well, that's, that's how the solar system is built, really. Yeah. And... What else was I going to say? I mean, the other, oh yeah, just just to point out, right? JWST is not or James Webb. It's not it's not where the Green Blob is at the moment. It's in a in a in a lab at Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles, having its <laughs> having going through its final uh, final tests. But uh, yeah, so we're we're uh, on our commissioning team. We're rehearsing operations every few weeks now. So uh, so we we have a you know we basically we simulate what we're going how we're going to operate. And we're simulating the things that we'll do if, if things go a bit wrong as well. So how we can uh, we can fix problems that we get with the spacecraft and yeah, it's um, yeah it's good fun. As I say, a bit stressful. It'd be I'll, I'll be happy when it's on its way. Really, yeah, it's incredibly exciting. So if you want to find where James Webb is um, right now, it will be well. Right now, it's in California, right? Yep. yep. But if you want to find where it will eventually end up, at the moment it that point is in Leo, but as the year goes on, that point will move around the constellations of the Zodiac. So the way I always find kind of where the Zodiac is, is I look for Orion because it's one of the easier ones. And then just above it here is Taurus the Bull and Gemini, which are two constellations that are um, summer constellations on the Zodiac. And then I kind of draw this line in my head and kind of follow that around the sky um, in order to find the rest of them. Because a lot of them, I'll be honest, don't look like what they're supposed to. I think Taurus does look like a bull, and Gemini looks like some twins, but some of them, like Aries, come on. What is that? Yeah, I've just, I've just had a question. It says, what is riskier for JWST, the launch or the unfolding of the heat shield? Well, yeah. <laughs> There's always someone like that, aren't there? Well, speaking of which, it's, this uh, was 
pretty much everything I had to talk about. Um, I think it was pretty much everything we had. Um, So shall we take some questions? Well, as I say, I was going to, this is Eduardo Ojeda has asked a question I was going to answer. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. With that, Kieran, sorry, yeah, yeah. So yes, okay, JWST, it's about the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big spacecraft. It's also very complicated. And it, when it's launched, it look, if, if, do you remember, I, I don't know, maybe not everyone, if, if, you, if you see one, when they put a car through a crusher, and it just looks like a kind of cube of metal, that's sort of what JWST will look like when it's launched. But it's, but it's not being crushed, you know, but it's all folded up very, very tightly in order to fit onto the, the top of an Ariane 5 rocket. And so it does have to deploy. It has um, several hundred motors to do the deployments. By deployment, I mean unfolding. The whole telescope is folded up and has to be, you know, has to unfold. That sun shield, it's actually in five layers, which have to be sent out like, um, like a sail on a, on, a, on a kind of a modern racing sailing yacht, you know, with sort of motors that drive out the sails on booms. And then there, then there are... Um, uh, Kevlar strings that then are tension up all of those, all of those, uh, those, uh, thanks, Kieran, yeah. So Alice is talking about, if you look closely, the sun shield here is made of these sort of five layers. Exactly, yeah, five layers, yeah, exactly. And so those are, those have to be, those have to be, the sun shield layers have to be taut and smooth and also well separated. And so, uh, so yes, Eduardo, yeah, indeed. I, I said there's, I'm going to be relieved after 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 launch. Um, no, uh, you're you're quite right. The deployment is extremely um, ambitious. Let's say that uh, it has been tested, retested, tested again. Uh, we are at the stage now where um, the sun shield has been has been um, stowed and deployed so many times on the surface of the Earth that it's having to be repaired a bit. I mean, it's all part of the plan, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's being well tested is what I'd say. But the one thing you can never test on the ground is how things will work under zero gravity in free fall, yeah, out in space. Um, and so, yes, that's still a big, it's a big risk. You can see here, that, as Kieran showed it, the, the, the telescope itself, it has that sort of uh, tripod structure that's holding the secondary mirror up. That has two hinges at the bottom of, the, of two of the legs. And then the third leg um, has a hinge in the middle and folds. And so, I mean, I've seen that being, uh, being uh, tested at, um, at another NASA lab a couple of years ago. And the whole thing is, uh, yeah, it, it, it is kind of nerve wracking. To... That's actually a very good point. So this doesn't look like a normal telescope. So for anybody wondering, um, oh. if this was a normal telescope, the tube would kind of go around this gold hexagon and like out this way. And basically, light comes in. This is the big main mirror that will be at the bottom. And then there's a second mirror here on this thing. So it bounces here, bounces off this mirror here, and then all the cameras and stuff are kind of in the middle and behind here. So it will all go into there. Um, so kind of related, how long will this, uh, how long will James Webb take to deploy? There's a lane, yeah. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so it, 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 it gets launched uh, from uh, Kourou in uh, a, in um, in um, it, it, the equator, and that's Halloween this year, right? It's end of October. currently it's end of October, all right. Yeah. I mean, the launch date will shift a bit because of weather and that sort of thing, but it's due and it's on track to meet that date as well. Thank goodness. I mean, it's been this project has been delayed years and years um, over the past twenty years. I've been working on this for uh, yeah, it's coming up to twenty years now that I've worked on it pretty well full time. But anyway, um, the deployment. So it gets launched, as I say, looking somewhat like a crushed car. It starts the deployment very quick. The first thing that happens is within um, an hour or so, which is the sun, the, the, it has solar arrays to generate electricity. So they unfold to, to start with because you need to have power going to, to power all of the mechanisms that you then have to run to deploy the rest of it. The sun, sh- it, it, okay, then it, it it's kind of gets launched on a pallet. That pallet has a little rocket motor on it that pushes the spacecraft out on its journey to start to L2. As soon as it's been pushed on its way, it starts the deployment. And that takes um, um, of the order of, a, of uh, it's several days to a week. I'd have to dig out the schedule, but it's about a week. So that, that happens fairly soon. After the first week or two, 
we'll know whether the telescope actually work, will is likely to work as a telescope. Yeah. In other words, you know, it kind of all came unfolded as expected. And then as it cruises on its way out to L2, it'll, it'll start cooling on the way there. And it takes it about a month to get to L2. That's pretty well it. So all in all, that's sort of two to three months of... Um, no, that's, it, no, it's a month. It takes a, a, a month from launch... Oh, I've added it up wrong. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, and that's... Um, we, we are, okay, for the instrument that I've, I work with, uh, Miri, we have to be super cold. So we can only start taking scientific data on day 99 after launch. Up until then, because, I mean, yeah, we're, our instrument actually to, to, get, to get really dark in the infrared, um, <clears throat> blackness, you know, darkness, it kind of equates to being cold. And because we're the most, the most interesting instrument, the, the longest wavelength instrument, we have to get colder than everyone else. So we have our own, um, it's something you'd find in, it, it's something similar to it in, in hospitals, but it's, um, it's a helium liquefier, uh, which often MRI scanners will use. But it's a space qualified type of helium liquefier. Yeah, I mean, it pretty well. Uh, and so we can actually, we, we have to call our instrument down to um, minus 268 degrees. It's, it's about uh, five degrees above, that, above absolute zero. So very, very cold. And we get, it takes us 99 days to get there and then switch on and then start to observe. I mean, just to give you an idea of how sensitive the spacecraft is, one of our biggest problems in planning this is that when we're looking at the distant universe, so I'm not talking about exoplanets now, uh, but uh, in the distant universe, the number of galaxies, we'll see so many galaxies that they will overlap with each other. And so we'll suffer from something called confusion, limita confusion limiting. Because we're so sensitive, we'll see every galaxy from us back out into the, the, the furthest reaches of the universe, which of course equates to you know, the first few million years of the universe, that those galaxies will all kind of be jumbled and sitting on top of each other. And, and if it wasn't, if, if, it, if we didn't have such good spatial resolution, in other words, if we couldn't see so, as much detail as the JWST can, because it's such a big telescope, we wouldn't be able to tell one galaxy from another. So it's, you know, it's, I mean, that's one of our kind of our, um, what's the word, our, you know, poster boy things is, is that, is that it's, it, we should be able to detect any galaxy in the universe. It's not the same it's as incredibly thing. exciting. But we can look at any one. If you can, if you pick it, we can we can observe it for you. Uh, Carl M says, um, sorry, if that's all right for Elaine and Edward. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more, and then we will have to. Well, maybe we'll quick. How long will it last? Uh, mission plan is five years. The goal is ten years. Uh, the thing that runs out on it is the uh, we use hydrazine to station keep at L two. So. L2 is not a, a stable place to be in the solar system. We would slowly roll away from it. So every now and again, we have to give it a burst of a of, of rocket, to keep it there. And what is the latest thinking of humans living on Mars one day? I understand this division of Elon, oh, good old Elon Musk, yeah. Uh, yeah, vision. Uh, it's been a vision as long as I've been you know, breathing, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I've got to say, I think we've got some bigger problems then I'm, I'm not really a big one for kind of colonizing space, right? I tend to think we need to sort of sort out global warming and do things like that. Keep an interest, yeah? Keep doing astronomy. That's good. But uh, technically, I think it's a bit of a, yeah. I, yes, I, large, I largely agree that I think we should yeah. sort Earth out before we worry about moving to Mars. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Alistair, for your time. This has been incredible. I hope you've had fun too. Um, and thank you everybody for watching. So just some really quick housekeeping before we go. Uh, we have a Twitter at Royal Obs. If you have questions we didn't answer, reach out to us there. And either myself or Fiona will probably get back to you. But if it's something really hard, we'll forward it on to Alistair. Um, visit our website. So we have recordings of all of these on our website. So if you missed part of this or if you want to share it with somebody else, uh, that's there and also our past uh, versions of this are there where we talk about various different things uh, and we have a mailing list um, all of this should be linked in the chat so you don't have to try and furiously write these down from the slide um, yeah thank you very much everybody uh, have a lovely evening I'm going to go have tea uh, good night everyone yeah thanks everyone uh, Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that arrive later via Q as well
Thanks, Kieran. Good. Bye-bye.